and in the presence of people that are fatalists and believe this is the end of it all. This is the end of an age, but God's not through yet because God's got a great awakening. God's got a great revival. And God's got a great harvest. And God's got a great church that he is going to fill before that final great and terrible day of the Lord. But we are in the presence of a great God and Savior right now. So let's enjoy the presence of the living God. Let's enjoy his saving, redeeming power that he has rained out upon us right now. Amen. As we enter into that place of the Lord, the secret place of the Most High God. And let's enjoy that pleasure that is eternal, that pleasure of his presence. Amen. That's fullness to be filled with the Holy Ghost, filled with the power of God, filled with the presence of a personal God that cares about the souls of you and I. Amen. In his presence is fullness of joy at his right hand. Our pleasures forevermore. We're serving an eternal God that is from everlasting to everlasting. We're serving a God that wants us to have eternal life and life more abundantly. We're serving a God that has mansions in eternity. And that's why we're here to worship him. That's why we're here in this place and presence. That's why we're seeking the Lord and his word. Because God, Solomon said in Ecclesiastes, has placed eternity an eternal desire and an eternal hope in each one of us. I plan to make my hope an eternity sure. I plan to make my hope an election in Christ sure. I plan to make my hope against hope. Amen. An Abrahamic belief in God that he is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we can ask or think through the power that works in us let's let it work right now one more time in praise let's let it work one more time amen in our worship let's let it work one more time as we exalt him with all of our heart soul mind and strength lord we love you today we worship you today and we desire to be empowered so that we might serve you, Lord God, day in and day out, according to what you have desired for our life, that we might have a long life, eternal life, that we might prosper as our soul prospers, and as you have told us, that we might be a success, God, in the things that really matter, success in the spiritual realms in jesus name you may be seated we're so thankful to connect with you again today on this live stream service uh, we are preparing as some of you probably already have seen in our church communique that went out yesterday that we have prepared a whole set of events for holy week that we would like you to be involved with and take the opportunity, number one, to make yourself aware of all the things in our communications. Then, of course, uh, be ready to move into these things that are available to us to celebrate, just as they did in the Holy Week so long ago in the times of the children of Israel in Egypt, as they celebrated in their houses, in their own household, and that they prepared a ark of covenant, an ark of salvation, some type of ark of a habitation of the spiritual, supernatural, word of God, bread of life. And then, of course, a ministry of everyone in their household, for God didn't just want priests in the ministry of the church. That is one level of priesthood. But he wanted the nation to become a nation 
of priests. And then, of course, every man and every leader and pillar of every household be the priest of his home. And so it was that God ordained that in the beginning. And I think he's drawn it back to that place again in our day and age. I saw a a Jewish uh, notation and many different ways to celebrate Passover right now that they're uh, focusing on. But it it was the statement, how is this Passover different from all other Passovers? This is unlike any Passover Passover any Jewish or any observant Christian has ever experienced in their lives. This is a special, unique, and a treasured moment that we need to understand that God has brought us in this delicate balance, uh, this delicate place of uh, uh, this spiritual tension that is going on. There are plagues and judgments and different types of things that are happening in this world as it moves forth with these viruses. But this is just a sequential aspect of many things that have been going on for the last seven years in intensity and now been brought forth to this point. We have been brought to a place where uh, how do we deal with uh, how it is affecting our lives? How do we have this shift, this spiritual shift towards a full and confident assurance, boldness and confidence, trusting in the Lord with all our heart, leaning not into our own understanding, acknowledging the Lord in all our ways and helping the Uh, allow him to uh, direct our paths, our judgments, that there might, in this direction we're looking for, be discretion, discernment, and spiritual uh, decision-making that takes place because God has prepared, in the midst of all these terrible things, some tremendous blessings for his church in this day and hour. So we invite you to be involved with our Holy Week. Uh, this is the Christian tradition as far as Holy Week goes. So we've sent you a chart uh, that you can quickly access, even print out, uh, about Palm Sunday, which we are celebrating uh, today. And then, of course, in this live stream service, and then uh, some passages of Scripture. In fact, I chose to take John the 12th chapter, moving through that all the way until the 21st chapter, and you'll see these designated each day for you to read the first day uh, is palm sunday because god's days start with sunday which is the first day of the week and so it became a christian tradition because it is the day that many christians believe in the calendar going all the way back to the proper dating that took place at the death burial and resurrection of jesus christ he was fully in the grave Three days and three nights, by the way. If you go back to the proper calendar, not traditional, denominational, or orthodoxy Christianity, but biblical, apostolic, and going back to first church Christianity, uh, it was, of course, uh, the first day of the week that he resurrected. And then, of course, uh, uh, in the midst of it all, we, we celebrate in this calendar, and you'll see it, it's eight days. Because God's economy and God's calendar was an eight-day calendar, not a seven-day calendar. Now, I don't have time to teach you all the deeper aspects of the eight-day calendar as uh, it reflects in the book of Revelation and as part of the eternities of God. But uh, in the midst of it all, uh, each day the Jewish culture says is married to each other. Monday uh, or Sunday to Monday, Tuesday to Wednesday, Thursday to Friday, Saturday to eternity. And so there is a marriage that takes place. And all the scriptures, the Bible said, are married. They are wove together. They come together with an understanding of this. I really don't have time to teach on end time events, the book of Revelation at this time, uh, biblical prophecy. But I promise you, someday I'd like to tap into these. And I hope to, if not in this uh, dimension and in this age, at least in the millennial age, to invite you to my own personal school of Tyrannius, where we can go into this in more in depth when we will not be wearied with many things that God wants to speak to us, but we cannot bear. 
because we need to be deeper biblically based. Uh, that being said, uh, again, Monday will be our day. It's called Poor Monday uh, in the Christian tradition, and it is a day of anointed fasting, and it celebrates the woman that came fasting and praying and seeking Jesus in the house and bathed his feet with her tears and then went ahead and wiped them with her hair and anointed his feet with the precious spike nard. And so uh, it is a time of fasting, weeping, mourning, uh, before the Lord, asking him for uh, forgiveness in genuine tra- uh, contrition, I should say, as we confess our sins, commit our lives to the Lord and come to a real conversion in Jesus tr- Christ where there's full change. Old things passed away, all things becoming new. We're moving into the aspect of Uh, Prophecy Tuesday, and I would like you to read in the Bible the prophecies of Jesus Christ as far as his death goes. The Bible says that Moses and Elijah, when they appeared unto him in the Mount of Transfiguration, wanted to ask him about his death more than about the revelation of Jesus Christ in prophecy, in end time events. As I've said many times on Wednesday nights, there are people who are more interested in the book of Revelation, the prophecy, and the mystery of iniquity, satanic uh, revelation of Antichrist, than they are in the mystery of godliness. We have two men that are studying on special studies that are dealing with that mystery of godliness, the mystery of Christ. And uh, those studies uh, are over a month old, so they should be well-seasoned and ready and uh, uh something that we'll be utilizing in Wednesday night studies when we return God's timing and will. Uh, And then, of course, Praise Wednesday, where we uh, are in Bible study again. And this is the time when there was praise and adoration that went forth uh, about Jesus Christ and what he was going to be doing. Prodigal Thursday is a time when uh, Judas uh, betrayed the Lord. And then, of course, uh, It is a time that many encourage throughout Christianity to reach out to the non-observers, to those that are living a life that is not pleasing to God or are not serving the Lord fully with all their heart at this time. Uh, And then, of course, Passion Friday. And we would like you to, in some way or fashion, whether it's viewing pictures or some type of different things uh, that are animation or, or just in a a type of Bible that has depictions of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, or if you're able to get your hands on the movie, The Passion of Christ, uh, take advantage of that and really spend time in uh, involving yourself in a vivid crucifixion depiction that really uh, allows us to understand just what sin cost our Savior when he paid the price and ransom us all. And then, of course, Peaceful Saturday, uh, where we look at eternity in preparation for that because it's a time of the tomb when Christ was in uh, the grave. And then, of course, Power Sunday, when we're going to, again, the eighth day, the uh, celebration of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. uh, For God raised him up with power and went ahead through the spirit and power of holiness uh, put him on high, and reaffirm the fact that he was the sinless Savior that solved that question for all of humanity for eternity. So we have that Christian tradition, and we invite you to be involved with us day by day, and we are actually going to, on Saturday also, uh, go ahead and broadcast a Seder dinner within the house. We've sent you a list of things that you can do. Prepare for it. You might want to go shopping early, get all the uh, things that are par- pertinent to this meal and have them ready because this is the way they celebrated it in Egypt before they left as God delivered them on that night of Passover. And so it is a lamb per house. And so it is to house to house. Uh, the pointing again is back to the Jewish feast. 
uh, we are looking at end time events that are taking place. And uh, the Jewish feasts, uh, all seven of them that are uh, predominant, and then, of course, the three times that we were charged, as every male should appear in Jerusalem, in Jerusalem, and worship at the temple. Uh, they are, of course, Pesach, Passover. They were Shavuot, or Pentecost. And then, of course, uh, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. The beautiful thing about where we're coming at very soon this week is the celebration of Christian Easter of what is known in apostolic ranks as Resurrection Sunday. And then, of course, in the Jewish culture, Passover of Pesach, in which three of the major feasts are encompassed together. Passover, uh, Pesach, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, Hag Hag Mazat, and then, of course, uh, the uh, La Rashid, Feast of First Fruits, the waving of that springtime as that event. Uh, finally ends on the eighth day. We are looking at these Jewish feasts because we are in a time very similar that looks back to Egypt and the escape that took place from that terrible place of affliction, bondage, and chains that they were involved in. And God used plagues to orchestrate the judgment of Egypt, the release of Israel, and then the redirection back into the fulfillment of the promises of God in Israel. So it was a fulfillment of a 400-plus year prophetic utterance of God that he revealed to Abraham in Genesis, the 15th chapter, and showed him what was going to take place for his children and children's children going forward. Uh, we have heard a lot of passages talked about in this this time that is taking place uh, as we celebrate this unique time and event that is happening and i do say celebrate as christians uh, and i do know that it is uh, uh, something that is judgmental to those that are out of the commonwealth of god and they are also confusing to those that are caught in this valley of decision the Bible says that uh, these are referenced in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah, the sixth chapter, the first verse, uh, in the time of the new year celebration, he said, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. In the year that King Uzziah died, the sequence of kings that he served under were gone. A new year, a new beginning, and a new time and season for the country was taking place. And it was time for trust to be not put into political leaders. The economy in Israel was under a shaking and a start of collapse so that their economical trust were being undermined. And then, of course, religiously, there were things taking place where God was raising up prophets again. And whenever the priestly uh, conduct was waning or falling behind and not stepping up to fulfill their roles as priests in the kingdom, God would have to send prophets to speak the judgments of God, cause another great awakening in Israel. So this was a new time and year. And then, of course, God began to reveal more things. We've read uh, from the rever several references within our own ranks that uh, this is a new thing that God is doing. Isaiah 43 and 19. And it does speak of what God's doing in the rising up of Israel that we have been discussing. And then, of course, uh, the things that are happening as God is moving in a mighty manner and fashion as he's allowing this regeneration to take place within the country which is uh, prefacing or, or predicating what is going to take place in a gigantic move of a regeneration of the Holy Spirit, a washing of regeneration, as there will be baptisms and mikvahs that were similar and greater than the days of John the Baptist, and a renewing of the Holy Ghost that God, as God pours out his spirit on all flesh, but especially Israel, the Shear Yeshua, the remnant, the tenth that is going to be saved in Israel 
joined into the church and God finishes this new stream uh, of in the desert that is a new thing that he's doing like never before in the nation of Israel. But then, of course, Isaiah 64, it talks about the things that are taking place that God was going to do a new thing, which was a terrible thing or a, a terrible judgment that was taking place on the earth. He said, oh, that thou would rend the heavens and thou would come down and that the mountains might flow down in thy presence as when the melting fire burneth, the fire causeth the waters to boil to make thy name to be known to thine adversaries that the nations may tremble at thy presence. When you did terrible things which we looked not for you came down the harim or the mountains flowed down and shook at thy presence for since ancient times or the beginning of the world men have not heard nor perceived by the ear neither hath it seen O god besides thee what you have prepared for him that waiteth on him. This is interesting because Paul draws in 1 Corinthians, the second chapter, from this same passage as he quotes, Eye has not seen, ear has not heard, neither hath it entered in to, amen, the heart of man, what God hath prepared for them that love him. And so he focuses on the, not just the supernatural man, because there is a physical natural man, but there is a divine nature, a supernatural man, a spiritual being. When we are born again of water and of spirit, we become a new creature in Christ. Old things passed away. All things become new. We have new eyes that uh, see in the spiritual realm and perceive. We have new ears that hear the word of God and want to obey it. We have a new uh, understanding that uh, takes place as we're spiritually sensitive to the touch and the feel and the seeking after the Lord. We have this oh, aspect of spiritual uh, sense and, and, uh, and smell where we sense the presence of God, the moving of God, the power of God, because we smell the incense, uh, the spike nard, the uh, frankincense, the myrrh that his body was anointed for by death, but still on him when he was resurrected in fullness of power. And they sensed it and they smelt it and they understood it when he passed through the wall at the place of the Last Supper, manifested himself to the apostles after the resurrection and prepared him to have that same presence when it came in as a rushing mighty wind and it filled that whole house and they smelt again the anointing amen oils of spike nard of frankincense and myrrh that were on the body of Jesus Christ when he came into that place and let me project further when they were before the Sanhedrin court and being judged they were told don't you reach or preach or teach in this name and when they spoke and when they uh, stepped forward with a authority and quoted the scripture they took note that these men had been with Jesus Christ you know why they felt the power of God they sensed the presence of God they smelt the spike nard they smelt the frankincense and myrrh the anointing of God on their lives and so God allows us also in a fashion to experience this presence. He says, let it flow at thy presence. And he again reiterates first, second, and third voice about the power of God and his presence. Oh, amen. I want to seek his face because in that day you seek me with all your heart. Are you awake right now? Amen. Still trying to get up this morning. Still trying to shake it out of your eyes. Amen. Or are you spiritually awake, spiritually alert, spiritually aware of the presence of the living God? Amen. At thy presence, at thy presence, at thy presence. I'm going to tell you, at his presence, these nations will shake. People, amen, will feel the powerful uh, hand of God upon their life. Just 
judgment will happen. But thank God we can, amen, have judgment begin at the house of God. We can repent of our sins, exonerate our souls, and then we can find that release because God is willing that none should perish, but that all, all should come unto repentance. Repentance. And so Paul allows us, one writer said, I believe it was Eliot's uh, commentary, he said that Paul definitely shifted here for them that uh, wait on him in Isaiah. He shifted it over to the place uh, that God has prepared for them that love him. He said, because you will not wait. You will not sacrifice. You will not keep yourself pure for someone you don't really love. You will want it all now. You will want it without a price. You will want some physical gratification without spiritual purification. He said true lovers follow the Jewish pattern of Jewish men that love their brides. And we will reference that in future studies someday as we study the seven great things of Jewish lovers that they did before they married or consummated and had a physical relationship with their brides that made it a true spiritual union and not just a physical attraction. Something to think about. Sounds like I'm pastorally counseling people that are trying to date. Uh, you know, the thing pastors have to do uh, in all of their pastoring, he said, uh, can be summed up, especially in the area of between a man and a woman. Before they are married, you try to keep them apart. After they're married, you try to keep them together. And so uh, a little summation of pastoral counseling when it comes to marital affairs. Thank you for that one laugh. Uh, <laughs> you've probably been together and very close the last couple of weeks. Amen. I asked one person in council yesterday, how's it going? I know your family's coming through a tough time. Several tested positive to COVID-19. You're in quarantine together. I said, uh, everything going good? He said, well, we haven't killed each other yet. I said, that's a great start. I mean, getting closer? Yes, very close. Amen. You loving each other more, more than ever. We're understanding what really is important right now. Amen. So Paul brings on this passage what many write and say, this is a reminder by Isaiah of what God did initially when he brought the plagues to Egypt. Then as he brought them to Shavuot, or the place of Pentecost, which, by the way, was Mount Sinai, where the law was given. And there the law, amen, came down to Israel. Later, he'd write the law within our hearts, as Jeremiah 31, 29 through 31 says, that the law can meet love. And then, of course, uh, the fulfillment that took place, another writer says, after they entered the promised land and renewed the, the uh, offering of Yom Kippur and they made atonement, they were able to enter into those promises of God in that place. And so they said this references those three great events, but especially, especially what happened in Egypt, especially the ten plagues that were taking place in that day and that hour. I want to look at that for a short moment today because as we bridged into this, we also see a similarity to what we had talked about about four Sundays ago in Psalm 103 that God said that he was the God that gave us great benefits, that forgives all our iniquities, amen, and uh, that heals all our diseases and that he talked about uh, in those Psalms 103 uh, and then, of course, uh, Psalm 91, the Lord lets us know also that he is a God that wants to take care of what was written in the Hebrew, plagues, diseases, pestilences, sicknesses, and also it talks about 
uh, any type of virus that God would be the keeper from it. He would be the preserver. He would be the one that protected us. He would provide divine provision of healing and strengthening and uplifting if we were a part of those that had contracted. And then he would be the redeemer, that restorer that would cause recovery and bring us through it. Did you know I've, I've, I've been in contact with some friends, pastoral friends and, and leaders across the United States uh, because of uh, different relationships over the years. There have been several of them that experienced COVID-19 attacks in their church. A pastor friend in New York told me in a church of over 1,000, 20 to 25 cases so far. He said, but every one of them is recovering. Another pastor friend in the near area got back with us, and they were rejoicing because we reached out during the time of their suffering and what they were going through, and I prayed with them and said, we're going to pray that God takes what the devil meant for evil because don't think the devil takes advantage of these things that are taking place as a world, as a nation, and a people forget their God. God's bringing them back to remember he is creator, he is savior, and he is the one that is the judger of all mankind. And uh, they told me that they're rejoicing because in a church that had over 40-plus people contact COVID-19, as we prayed what the devil meant for evil, God would turn to good and make all things work together for good to them that love God and are the called according to his purpose in that church. To this point, everyone has recovered. I'm talking about apostolics. And then uh, another church uh, in the South that is experiencing uh, attacks and so forth. And we have not heard of one death in that church yet. Every minister that was on our prayer list for the last three weeks has now been raised up except one. And I believe God's going to finish the work in his life because we're praying with deep compassion and empathy and intercession that God work a work. And it's with heartfelt tears and, uh, and uh, petitioning of God that's taking place. I'm telling you, God's going to do a mighty work. God's going to show himself strong on the behalf of them that are upright. God is going to do miracle signs and wonders in these last days to show who is. I said, who is the people of the birthright? Who are the people? that have the blessings of God. Who is the blessed of the Lord and has tapped into his redemption? Oh, let's praise him right now and thank him for that. Hallelujah. We appreciate you for what you are doing, what you are accomplishing. Lord God, for your people, you are a great God and Savior. You are a caring and loving and compassionate God. Lord, you didn't, Lord God, amen, desire anyone, Lord, to suffer and to bear pain. But we who are the husbandmen and partakers of the first fruits understand, amen, that you take the sting of death out. And God, give us, Lord God, the hope of eternal life as you heal. Lord God, save and give people, amen, a hope in glory. Christ in us, the hope of glory. Back to these plagues. I want to tell you that God is dealing with the abominations of all nations. Everything that is being judged right now, shut down, or God is causing to be brought into bankruptcy are things that used to be preached as a standard of demarcation or holiness that we separated from. And not just in the apostolic ranks, but it goes all the way into the evangelical ranks. In fact, there are few denominations that did not have 
the same standards of holiness in the 60s as we did as apostolics in the year 2000. There's also judgment upon uh, things that I, and I'm going to list them down the line, and I, I feel uh, a poor importance, and we really need to pray about this, but abortion. One-fourth of our nation, our heritage, and our babies and children have been killed in this nation since 1950. Over 40 to 50 million abortions. And what are they trying to do to balance out the budget, to balance out Social Security, to get more taxpayers? Amnesty for illegal immigrants because it has already been proven and uh, mathematically projected that it will take what? 40 to 50 million more taxpayers to balance the budget to pay for the baby boomers, Social Security, and Medicare. That could have easily been taken care of if we did not allow abortion in this nation. We sealed our own fate. Plus, we added the murder of the innocents to our lives. In fact, even further, euthanasia is being lauded right now as a solution to deal with the baby boomers and to the Social Security and Medicare issues, which, by the way, have robbed, been robbed multiple times to pay for wars, for projects of infrastructure, even highways back in the 60s and 70s. So they're projecting that this many people have to come into the, the payment system. But if, if this group 60 to 80 plus is most high risk, most vulnerable to COVID-19, then why don't we let it run its course, get the economy going back forward because this country's bankrupt already. It's going to collapse. And let these baby boomers be weeded out so that we will have less people to pay Social Security and Medicare and other different types of benefit programs to. That's being floated right now. Sobering situation. Let me mention these other abominations. Idolatry. We are a nation that worships our, our entertainment industry, our sports figures, and other people that are in prominence in areas of the uh, movie industry and other areas. Uh, we have lauded them, music industry, and given them a prominence of godlike figures or divas. Uh, so to speak, so that they are idolized and worship. God shut every one of those venues, those sporting events, those coliseums down because he's letting us know, amen, there's only one Lord, one faith, and one baptism, one God, and Father of all, who is above all, through all, and in you all. And we need to get back to him being the God on the throne of our life, not the small G-O-Ds of this world. Satanism, the, the love of witchcraft and darkness and other things that are involved in the, the supernatural is a sign that there's a passion for the supernatural things, but there is a misdirection of affection in the things of darkness. The area of pornography, this is such a sensuous, sexually orientated, and, and just a, a uh, un- unsatisfied society when it comes to the things of sexual gratification and pornography, the lust of the eye and the lust of the flesh are combined with this driving force that is taking place. Flee youthful lusts. Grow up, be mature, and start living as a spiritual adult 
in Jesus Christ. Uh, the things of sodomy, the sodomite abominations that are something that has constantly been judged and refuted by God. I have a three-page study of over 50 scriptures in the Bible that reference this and show God's extreme disgust and his judgment of such and his desire to keep his people the way that he created them. Uh, but in the midst of it all, we are moving forward with this agenda and it's being uh, literally and figuratively shoved down the throats of our children in every area of education, academia, and, and then, of course, uh, again, in multimedia and the movie uh, uh, industry, which is owned and driven and strengthened by homosexual owners in Los Angeles and Hollywood and across the music industry globally. Why wouldn't they push their agenda? They've been lauded as such. Let me move forward. Divorce. We might think it's a trite thing. But marriage and divorce is very serious to God. Jesus Christ said, from the beginning, divorce was not the will of God. A man shall leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and the twain shall be one flesh. He said, have you not read what God hath joined together? Let no man. And that doesn't just mean an adulterer or a predator or some type of outside lover. That means the you and the me that look in the mirror daily. Let no man or woman draw, pull apart, or make separate. Because from the beginning, God meant for it to be one man and one woman in one union of holy matrimony and i'll tell you the one that is probably the most insidious that's pride that was the number one sin of sodom pride that's one of the number one things that god hates in the book of proverbs the sixth chapter pride it is the thing that jesus said was totally opposite of who he was he said come and learn of me i am meek and lowly and humble man and you shall receive rest for your souls because they're things that demand of us because of our pride that causes us what the bible says many hurtful lusts these things are being judged by God right now in our society. And uh, we need to understand that God will save the world by Jesus Christ. God so loved the world, John 3, 16 said, that uh, he gave his only begotten son that whomsoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. God will save the world by Jesus Christ. But don't ever forget what he said in 2 Timothy 4, 1, that God will judge the world by Jesus Christ. He's a savior now. He's the lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. But when he comes before that throne, takes the books and uh, steps upon it as the righteous throne of judgment, the righteous judge of all the earth uh, as he sits before mankind at the judgment seat of Christ. That the Bible makes it very clear. Now he's the lion of Judah that brings Righteous judgment upon this earth. And then God will judge the world because of sin, because of lack of righteousness, and because lack of spiritual judgment, John 16, 8 through 13 said. And so these plagues are definitive. These plagues are directed. These plagues are something that in detail are hitting the gods of Egypt, but also the Egypt of America today. The first plague, water to blood. That plague, of course, uh, was able to be imitated by the uh, priests of Pharaoh's uh, court 
but it was a judgment of God's kum, which was the guardian of the river's source, Hapi, the god of the annual flooding of the Nile and the lord of the fish. In fact, even in the farthest reaches of the Middle East, even to the Mesopotamian Valley, until you get into the next river system of the Euphrates and the Tigris rivers, on every area of different temples or even economic commerce places of trade, you will see in murals and on the floor a depiction of a Egyptian Nile stick which showed the height of the Nile River for as the Nile flooded its banks it would fertilize the fields and the surrounding land and there would be greater harvest and so if the Nile was really high grain costs would be low because of supply and demand more grain less cost if the Nile was very low and didn't flood its banks there'd be less grains and less provision and so they literally were were able to cause what we call in the stock market today the futures market based on the rising and falling of the Nile River. And so in this aspect that was taking place, it was very prominent. You can see it in the Commerce Center, uh, in the synagogue, uh, even in the synagogue at Zippori in an area that we visit. Zippori was once the town next to Nazareth. It was 60,000 people. And uh, Nazareth was only 600. Now Nazareth is 60,000 people. And Zippori's only six. Those are the people that work for the government there in the park system. But the mural's there. And so Osiris had the Nile, the, uh, the uh, mythological ideas. Osiris had the Nile was literally his bloodstream or his circulatory system depicted in their worship of Osiris, their highest God. And so God, when he judged the Nile River, showed he was judging capitalism or the economical structure of the worship of Egypt. You know, Scripture says in Matthew 6.24, you cannot serve God and mammon. You cannot serve God and mummy. You cannot serve God and only live for your investments, for your 401ks, for your pensions, for your houses and lands. Jesus said it so clearly, don't get choked spiritually when it comes to the things of God. He said there were areas because people in the cares of this life were more worried about houses and lands and buying and selling, planting and growing and everything that deals with our financial positions that God's judging right now. And we're realizing if we just follow God's tithe and offering and alms system, if we just follow God's good stewardship, if we let God open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing, we won't sacrifice our time, our family, or our ministry because we're too busy chasing the Nile River economical system. Let me hurry. Plague 2, the frogs, Exodus 8, uh, 1 through 8, 15. And then it talks about this judgment uh, because there is a goddess Hecht, which was an Egyptian goddess that had a head of a frog, and she was involved in sexualism because of the fertility of the frog that abounded in this day and age. I went fly fishing with my wife for three hours, a place one mile from the house, and we had a walk in the woods. God bless you. Uh, we went fishing. We didn't go catching. That's why it's called such. But uh, uh, in the midst of it all, I saw uh, the only things that were trying to hit my fly were the tadpoles that were already spawning very early in the river backwaters. And I was reminded of this, this worship of the frogs in Egypt because they were some of the first animals. And they also worshiped the amphibious mindset of the geological column of evolution that we came from the waters and amphibians and then mammals and so forth, similar to what evolutionists believe today. And so God judged this goddess Hecht, but she was also the goddess of sensuality or pornographical aspects. So always depicted in the nude. 
and they emphasized her sexual features. And God said, no, amen. I'm going to judge this because 2 Thessalonians 2.12 said, if you have not a love for righteousness or pleasure in unrighteousness, not a love for the truth. God will send strong delusion that you might believe a lie and be damned. Amen. And that's an end time prophecy. The third plague was gnats or lice. And then, of course, uh, this judgment duplicated uh, things that were uh, part of God's creative process so that the Egyptian priests could not duplicate it in their abilities. And they literally looked to Pharaoh and said, this is the finger of God. This is creation. This is the God of the universe. This is the God of glory that has done this. They said he was the God, Geb, which was the God over the dust of the earth. Because remember, they threw the dust in the air and it turned to lice. And that's what they believed in. Any unseen pestilence or plague or virus was considered a product of the God, Geb. And God went ahead and dealt with this, that we were not to be a people that believed in evolution. But we are a people that honored their creator, that one father and God over all of us, Malachi said. Amen. Jesus declared in Luke eleven twenty that when uh, they were uh, saying that he was of the devil or Beelzebub and so forth, and that's how he cast out devils. He said, if I, by the spirit of God, cast out devils, then the finger of God has truly come on to you. And he reminded them of Egypt. This is God's finger. Oh, he was the right arm of salvation. He was the hand of God reaching out in power, but he was the finger of God that did miracles, signs, and wonders, and healed and delivered and raised up people from the dead. Can you say amen? Fourth plague, flies. This was the first plague that affected only the Egyptians. And, of course, Capri was the head of the beetle. And he also was the head of the needle that moved the sundial. And so the worship of astrology rather than the worship of the God that is the son of righteousness that riseth with healing in his wings. Malachi 4.2 says, isn't it great to know we've got a new day, we got a new dawn, we got a day star. Every, haven't you enjoyed the beautiful sunrises? and sunsets the last few days. Look up. There's a son of righteousness that says, I'm still on the throne. I'm still over all. I'm still with you. It's not over yet, church. Amen. I'm the son of righteousness. I've got healing in my talits, in my zitzits, in my uh, wings that I have set forth for you, and I will rain it upon you as you reach forth to me, seek me, and touch the hem of my garment. Plague 5 was the sick cattle in Exodus 9. Through one through seven, and this is the distinguishment between Israelite and Egyptians. Again, the the plague affected only the Egyptian herds and only those that wouldn't put their herds in shelter and obey God. Watch this though. Hathor was the fertility goddess that was depicted in this, and she had the head of a bull and a body of a woman. She was a transgender cross dressing goddess. And I believe this is God dealing not only with cross-dressing, with transsexuals, but also the whole LGBTQ agenda. And that's part of God's judgment in this day, in this hour, folks. We have reached a maximum of abominations that has tipped the scales of judgment and caused God to come down in his wrath trying to wake us up get us in a place where we are aware of him his word his judgments and then to be alert when his presence comes to reach out to him to receive healing salvation and divine deliverance and redemption through jesus christ 
our Lord. I'm so sorry. I've got to hurry. Amen. Plague 6. I'm sorry for you. This is a great study. Exodus 9, 8 to 12. The, the plague of boils. And this again was a distinction. So strong was it that the Egyptian priests were unable to appear into court. They took time off because of the boils or the hemorrhoids that were affecting them. Isis was the goddess of health. Imhotep was the god of healing. And I believe this is God judging our medical trust rather than trust in the Lord. Thank God for medical advancements. Uh, thank God for scientific things that are, are accomplishing great uh, uh, possible vaccines and treatments uh, and uh, providing a semi-cure for uh, this. There is no vaccine for AIDS yet. There is no vaccine for SARS yet. There is no cure for either of those yet, by the way and several other diseases that have been uh, given a lot of prominence and, and focus in the last 20 years. But thank God for all that is being accomplished, uh, that it can slow down, but it's not going to stay it, stop it, or cause it to be uh, something that is uh, never stirred up again. Let me tell you, amen, we need to remember, as Jeremiah 8.22 said, is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? I mean, Jesus Christ is our great physician. He is our great healer healer. He is the balm of Gilead. His name is his ointment poured forth. And if we anoint the sick with oil in the name of the Lord, the prayer of faith shall save the sick. The Lord shall raise them up. And even if they've committed, amen, any type of sin, if they confess their faults, their failures, and their frustrations to God, he'll forgive their sin and raise them up and make them whole. The uh, other was the hell and uh, the things that are taking place uh, in this judgment when uh, the scripture talks about in Exodus 9, 13 through 35, that it fell on all of the livestock again and a judgment of, of all the things that were happening that came down from the sky. So nut was the goddess of the sky. I thought, well, if you worshiped her, you must have been a nutcase. Her father, Shu, the god of wind and air, and it reaches back to our, our 60s and 70s worship when we started to get into all the things of going back to nature, back to the earth, back to worshiping Mother Earth and Father Son. And it was uh, talked about water, earth, fire, wind, and fire. Even some rock groups, earth, wind, and fire, were brought forth because they were all getting back into this, this uh, uh, earthly mysticism that was taking place. Uh, and it was focused uh, on a matriarchal society, an inversion of what took place in the original creation and uh, the things that God set forth for family structure. But this was a judgment of the meteorological things that were taking place. I don't have time to talk about this, but this is God's signs in the sun, moon, and stars, signs in the heavens that Peter even talked about in Acts, the second chapter, when he said that these would take place in his quotations of the uh, book of uh, Joel, and uh, he said, I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs in the earth, blood, fire, vapor, and smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whomsoever, what, shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. I've taught many studies on the seven wonders. There are seven uh, warnings and witnesses and wonders that are part of this end time gospel that's being preached. That is going to happen, as Matthew talked about in the 24th chapter, before the end of the age takes place. Not the end of the world, but the end of the age. There's a differentiation there. But some of these wonders with the seven tetrads that have happened in Jewish feasts, significant events that have happened throughout history on the tetrads, the things that were matched by solar eclipses. And then uh, the uh, last tetrad that was taking place that will not happen again for 80 years. You saw that in 2013, 2014. We taught on that. But there were also four major rare solar eclipses that took place. And then, of course, lunar eclipses that followed that. We talked about just recently, a couple of years ago, the super blue blood moons, three that took place in a series over six months. And now that is happening right now, Mars. March, April, and May are the super moons that are happening back to back to back in 2020. And this next one is going to be on Pesach, Passover, on the exact day that science and our government and all political figures in the world have said will be the peak 
day of the COVID-19 virus attack on the world. What are you going to do? We're in the middle of a Passover. That's what God ordained. You need a Passover lamb for your house. You need Christ, your Passover, that was once offered for us all. We need the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. That lamb that was slain from the foundations of the world as God's plan. We need a lamb for a house. We need a lamb for every one of us. We need that lamb, amen, taking our place in propitiation for sin as we repent, lay hands on him, and confess our sins. We're buried with him in baptism so that we will receive full remission of sins and we're raised up with that Lamb of God in newness of life with that efficacious, never dying, everlasting blood of him flowing through our veins as we're now part of the body of Christ, the Lamb of God, and embedded in his salvation and redemption and propitiation rather than his lion body of judgment and wrath and God's hand in the day of the Lord on us. Let me finish. Locust. There is a resurgence of locusts all across the Middle East and the whole region of what I believe is the 10th to 20th parallel that's in the Northern Hemisphere right now. It's raging across the world. God's sending another sign. Nepir and Nepri were the God and goddess of grain. But they're also uh, goddess and goddesses of disorder. We are in a deconstructionist, destructive De go ahead and uh, declassify the importance of religion in our world today. But the Lord said, and Paul said, that there would be a judgment of agriculture. Can you believe one? I saw one writer that is a head of the future markets and all that. Don't worry about America. All of our major fields, they're still producing. They're still going to go ahead and have crops. There's going to be plenty of food. Folks, we can't even keep our truckers on the job. They are losing places to stop and to gas up and to go ahead and have a time of respite. They are working double and triple shifts. I shouldn't say triple. Amen. But they're doing uh, multiple jobs and runs to try to keep up. I just passed an Amazon truck today that was delivering uh, different goods to households on a Sunday. They can't keep up with it all. To make a prophecy and say we're going to have enough food when maybe we can't even go into the stores because there's no one to man them because they've all got COVID-19. Bible says in 1 Corinthians 14, 40, let everything be done decently and orderly and he is a god of order that's going to judge this world and its liberality or liberalism and all the areas where we are trusting in the arm of flesh rather than the mighty arm of god darkness Philippians 2.10 says that when this judgment of darkness came, God would judge also this satanical, demonical, satanistical culture that we are in right now that is so uh, completely obsessed with the evil and darkness. And God brings judgment. Every knee is going to bow of things in heaven, things in earth, and get, get a hold of this Satan, things under the earth, in the thrones of hell, and the lower parts of the earth. God will judge it like he judged Ra when Jehovah God showed that he had power even over the mightiest gods of Egypt in the plague of darkness. Look, darkness and light are the same to God. He created them all. Amen. But he wants us to have light instead of darkness. He is the light of this world. And you need to come to the church and the truth and the preaching of this gospel and be saved. For God is light and in him is no darkness at all. And the church is that city set on the hill. You are the light of this world. And God wants us to find what the first church believed. Repentance, water, baptism in Jesus name and the filling of the Holy Ghost. And lastly, was Christ the Passover. I'm going to talk about this in detail, why that Passover was so important. Next Sunday morning, and I, I trust to do it in a, a more concise and shorter fashion, but the six questions of life answered by the Passover lamb. And God gave this 
Passover. He smote the firstborn of all Egypt that did not have a lamb. In fact, many Egyptians had lambs. Many Egyptians put the blood of the lamb over their doorpost. Many Egyptians that were pre-warned joined in this, except for Pharaoh and his unbelievers. And the scripture said that all the firstborns were killed, just like in emphasize they had killed all the firstborns and babies of Israel through multiple infanticides or what we would call live birth abortions today. Isn't it amazing the city that is suffering the largest amount of deaths, the largest amount of COVID-19 was also the city legislator that stood up and applauded when they passed the live birth abortion law in their city and their state first. God said, enough is enough. Murder is murder. And their blood is crying to me from the earth. It's time to get out of humanism, socialism, or this social order that's trying to be brought forth right now. It's called the Fourth Reich. It's called the Fourth World Order. And it's here. And it's time to shift and seek first, Matthew 6, said, the kingdom of God and its righteousness and all things, these things shall be added to you. There's wonders in the heaven above happening. There's signs in the earth beneath. Blood, fire, and vapor, smoke, earthquakes, tsunamis, things that are taking place as rare occurrences are happening. There's even a country right now that blood is flowing out of the ground. They still don't know what's causing that blood-colored flow to take place as it flows down the streets. Folks, what does God have to do? The sun turned into darkness, moon into blood for that great and notable day of the Lord. The good news is it's before the great and notable day of the Lord, day of wrath, day of great tribulation. We got one more chance. We got one more day, one more hour to make things right with God. And today, you and I, where we stand or sit, at church in your home, we can call on the name of the Lord Jesus and be saved. We can call on his name and say, Jesus, save me. Jesus, help me. Jesus, forgive me as we repent. We can call on his name as we are baptized, and we will baptize you anytime you need it in the lovely name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission, forgiveness, pardon, and release from your sins. Calling on the name of the Lord as they did in Acts 8, 22. But also, we'll lay hands on you and you will receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. In fact, where you're at right now, you can receive the Holy Ghost. That power, that presence, that personal relationship of God that he really meant you and I to experience Christ in you, Christ baptized in you, Christ Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, the one that, Holy One that died for you and I, only one Jesus Christ did in us, power, presence, and personal relationship as you call on his name and say, Jesus, come to me. Jesus, fill me. Jesus, let your presence come into my heart and my soul. Jesus, let it flow through my being. Jesus, let me receive your spirit like they did in the first century church on the day of Pentecost when they were all filled and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gives utterance. So I yield my mouth, I yield my throat, I yield my whole being. Lord, that which is rising up in my chest, through my throat, wanting to take control over my tongue, my most unruly member of my whole being, I yield it right now. 
I submit it. I allow it to be under your control that you might be Lord, you might be king, you might be the creator on the throne of my heart. Lord, I receive your Holy Spirit right now. I'll speak in that language that I don't understand. I'll speak in that language, tongues of men and angels. I will speak in that language, which is that heavenly language as I become part of a new kingdom with a new king and a new sovereign God over my life. Thank you for giving me the Holy Ghost that I can experience all of the Levitical Feast of Passover, Hag Hamazat, and La Rashid. Repentance, laying hold of the Lamb of God, a Passover Lamb. Dying out to the old life, flat as that bread of unleavened nature. And then risen in newness of life, La Rashid, as I wave to heaven, speaking with tongues telling forth the wonderful work of God as he begins a new life and a new beginning and a fresh start in this new year that has begun by the Passover feast that answers the plagues of our world as God gives us peace and righteousness and joy in the Holy Ghost. God bless you. God keep you. Thank you for your being with us today. Join us in Holy Week. Join us next Sunday as we talk about the six questions of life answered by the Passover Lamb. And then join us in our weekly studies and discussions as we finish the book of Obadiah and the series on great intercessors going forward. God bless you.